you, you brought up um, chapters one and two from, from Currency Wars, where you, you basically highlight uh, this scenario. Um, you said the scenario you presented at the time was that Russia and China would accumulate large gold reserves, pool their gold, and launch a new digital currency backed by gold in the place of the U.S. dollar. Is that the form it would take for you, something backed by gold? Probably, and here's why. Um, and, and by the way, when I when I wrote that, when we did the war game, and when I wrote that, Russia had about 600 tons of gold, and today they have 2,300 tons. China had about 600 tons of gold, and today they have about 2,000 tons, just slightly less, that we know of. And they may have several thousand tons off the books in the State Administration of Foreign Exchange that we don't know about because that's the, the, that's completely opaque. So Russia and China did exactly what we warned the Pentagon about in 2009, exactly, which is increase their gold reserves by a factor of four or more. Um, so, but uh, everyone's like, well, the Chinese yuan is going to be the global reserve currency. No, and it's not going to be the group. But, but, but here's why. Uh, well, there are a lot of reasons, but the main reason is when you talk about reserve currency, you have to understand what that means. It's not like the People's Bank of China has a bunch of $100 bills on pallets stacked up in the basement. When people say reserve currency, what they really mean is the currency of the bonds that they invest in. In other words, they're dollar-denominated assets in the form of treasury bonds or notes. That's what China actually has on their books, um, not like the dollars per se. So if you want to suggest or hypothesize that the Chinese yuan is going to replace the U.S. dollar as a global reserve currency, where's the yuan bond market? I mean, it doesn't exist. Uh, very small scale, very liquid, no primary dealers, no win issue trading, no auctions, um, no repo, none of the sell- no settlement clearance, none of the, uh, the plumbing and the mechanics of, uh, of a mature bond market such as the, uh, the United States. Uh, and above all, they don't have a rule of law. I mean, at least if you, you know, somebody reneges on treasury bond, you can sue somebody, but you can't do that in China. So the absence of the rule of law, number one, the absence of the infrastructure, the plumbing, for want of a better word, are two reasons why the yuan and, and certainly the ruble will not replace the dollar as a reserve currency. However, what I was hypothesizing then, and I would I'd come back to this, is you can create a brand new currency that does have all that stuff. And in my example, they, they used a Swiss bank, um, UK law, uh, put the gold in a third party depository. If you wanted some of the new currency, you could deposit your own gold and get some of the currency or trade with them or run a surplus. So it was a, it was a replacement system, but it, but you, you would need the gold to, to instill confidence. Um, but uh, they don't, they, again, they don't have bond markets, so they're not going to have them soon. So those, the yuan and the ruble aren't going to replace anything. In the terrifying picture you've just painted, Jim, um, how, how should we be protecting ourselves here? Well, uh, you want assets that are going to be immune from a global liquidity crisis. What are they? Uh, land, real estate, gold, silver, you know, fine art. Uh, you know, I see Andy Warhol, Marilyn Monroe has gone they estimate two hundred million dollars. You could have bought that for fifty thousand in the in the nineteen seventies. Uh, that's that's a little more specialized. But there are you know natural resources, uh, water, you know, et cetera, uh, energy, oil. Uh, if you want to be in stocks, okay, get stocks of companies that are based on natural resources, um, you know, such as Exxon Mobil, Chevron. I mean, I'm not. Uh, I'm just giving these as an example. But um, so there are there are a lot of ways to protect yourself. But uh, um, you know, a regular stock portfolio um, is not a good one. And you know, banks are going to be in, in distress. Money market funds are going to be in distress. That's what a liquidity crisis is. We we seem to have a huge chunk of our working age population that is not working. And you probably study this more than most people. Like, what's what's truly going on there? Um, do we have a uh, is, is it just an aging population that truly can't work? Um, I know that disability has been a, has seen massive growth over the past like 15 years. Um, you know, are there a bunch of people that are opting out or gaming the system or whatever? But what's responsible for us only having 62 percent of our working age population actually engaged in working? Well, there are two answers to that, and but they're consistent. I'll give you both. The short answer is it doesn't matter. And no, you, you you listen to a number of factors. I'll go back over those factors, and you're, you're right. But it doesn't matter. It, it low is low. In other words, the the thing about labor force participation is a very simple calculation. You you say how many people are working. That's the 
the, the uh, numerator. And how big is the labor force? That's the denominator. That's all it is. Now, it's never 100%, right? Because there are students and homemakers and retirees and others. There are good reasons for some people not to be in the workforce at any given time. But as recently as 2000, that number was 70%. What drove it between 19, about approximately 1975 and 2000 was basically women entering the workforce, women who had been home, um, you know, as homemakers or, uh, you know, performing other roles entered the workforce and then that number went up. So it, like I guess it's never a hundred, but 70 was very strong. 62 is, is down a lot. I mean, that's, um, about a 14% decline. Um, look, you know, GDP, the standard definition is, um, you know, it's consumption plus investment plus net exports plus, you know, government expenditure, like a four part thing. Yeah, but there's a simpler way to do it, which is how many people are working? How productive are they? Just who's working and how productive are they? That, that equals nominal GDP. Um, and if you have fewer people working, there's the, the economy is going to shrink unless productivity is going up, which it's not. Uh, and so this is one of the major headwinds. Now, you're right. There are some early retirees. Um, there were a lot of people who stayed home, obviously, during COVID. And just it, it's very well studied and clear that um, working is a habit, you know, it's put a good habit, I think, for the most part. But it's like any habit. Once you break it, it's hard to go back. So once you get used to not working, or working from home or, you know, we're just staying home. Um, the government was handing out checks, you know, beginning with Trump in, uh, I believe it was June 2020. Everybody got a, uh, that one was a $1,400 check. And then in December 2020, at the end of the Trump administration, everybody got a $600 check. And Biden comes in in February 2021, not to be outdone. He hands out, uh, I think, a $1,600 check. Um, so everybody got a check, like two or three of them. And uh, a lot of younger people uh, opened accounts on Robinhood and started trading Bitcoin. That didn't work out too well. But um, but a lot of people saved the money. But but there was a very there were def- very definite spikes in retail sales coming within 30 days of the checks. Well, that's not surprising. I give people free money. They'll go buy stuff. And that kind of kept the economy going. It wasn't a real boom, but it, yeah, it, 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 um, it looked good, but we're not doing that anymore. There's no more checks. Uh, and so you had a lot of people lost the habit, a lot of people staying home, watching, you know, maybe, uh, the World Series or whatever, eating Doritos, but they're not working. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, a lot of people out of the habit, but they just got used to government handouts. Not everybody. But, but some. And, um, the other problem is, uh, you know, cause people say, wait a second, how can you have low labor force participation when everywhere you look, they're help on the signs, which there are. I mean, I was, right. you know, McDonald's is paying a $35,000 for an entry level, like cashier or hamburger, um, you know, maker, uh, with benefits, training and advancement. Well, that's pretty good for, you know, uh, entry level hamburger person. Um, so there are late, the, and people call this a labor shortage. There isn't actually a labor shortage because we just talked about how you've got perhaps as many as 10 million, you know, people between the ages of 25, 54 who are sitting home. But the problem from the employer's point of view, there's a shortage of willing workers. Not, willing workers, yeah. Not workers, but willing workers. Well, what makes you willing to work? Well, a, a raise, <laughs> a good pay is, is one. You know, as employers can't afford to pay the clearing wage, to get people off the couch because they'll go bankrupt themselves. They're working on very small margins. You know, sales are declining, et cetera. So I'll pay as much as I can to get the workers, but it's not enough to get this person off the couch, so to speak. And so you've got this really weird situation. I use weird in the, in the technical sense where you have a huge pool of able-bodied, you know, potential workers but a shortage of willing workers because you can't pay a clearing wage. But that's more a reflection of uh, how stressed business is and how low margins are. And then you look at the big names. I mean, um, I guess Twitter is the most recent, but, uh, you know, Amazon, FedEx, um, you know, Target, uh, they're all looking at, at big layoffs. And big layoffs, big, yeah. Big layoff announcements coming every day. So um, not, but none of which is good for, uh, for the U.S. economy. But, um, I, you know, the Fed looks at unemployment. I mean, I look at it because you're supposed to know what it is. I mean, uh, I always say, if you're, if you're trying to forecast the Fed, you got to look at the world the way they do, even if it's messed up. Like, even if they're looking at the wrong things, which they are, as an analyst, you have to look at them to figure out what they're doing. That's 
That's how you do intelligence work. Think like the other guy. But then once I take my Fed hat off and say, well, what do I think? Um, the, the unemployment rate is almost irrelevant. First, that's a lagging indicator. Secondly, it ignores what we talked about with labor force participation. There is no Phillips curve. I mean, you can draw one. Last time I saw Phillips curve was flat. Well, when I went to school, curves weren't flat, but that's, uh, but they're, they're just looking at the wrong indicators.